Welcome to our study on the book of Ephesians. Uh, this is session 11B2. And uh, this again, we're so, going to be talking about the positions of governmental authority. When we left off last time, we were actually looking at a scripture in the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. So let me bring that up on the PowerPoint, and let's take a look at this. It says that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Now, when we were looking at this the last time, we actually talked about those first two areas of things, things in heaven and things in earth. But what are the things? Well, just to refresh our memory, the things are positions of governmental authority. So what would positions of governmental authority be in the heavens? All right. So if things in heaven, that would be, somebody give me an example. What would be a position of governmental authority in the heaven? Oh, good, thrones. Yeah, there you go, principalities and powers, you got it. Now when it talks about and things in the earth, that is talking about the governmental positions of, uh, so, so up in the heaven, of course, uh, let's just put the uh, principalities and powers, we'll just abbreviate that. On earth, these are the governmental positions of men. So that would be kings, prime ministers, presidents, governors, whatever those are. That's things in the earth. So of things in heaven, all of those positions of authority up there. Of things in earth, all those positions that men hold on the earth. And now we get to the part that we want to pick up on that I told you we would look at. We just didn't get a chance to do it last time. And that is things under the earth. And that's the part that we've highlighted on the PowerPoint here. So when we're talking about things under the earth, what in the world are we talking about? This, when you're, ta when you're talking about things that are under the earth, we're actually talking about the positions of governmental authority that are not in the realm of men but are in the realm of the supernatural, but it is taking place on the earth. Now the reason Paul says, and things under the earth, is because he is actually associating those supernatural powers with the underworld. In other words, to differentiate it from the positions of men. So in other words, these two are taking place on the earth. This one is taking place in the heavenly places. This one is the positions that men have. Those are the visible ones, the one you can see. This is the positions of various kinds. We're going to list some of them and go through them. We're actually going to turn to some scriptures here. But that's not the positions that men hold. Today, that would be positions of, of those who are in league with Satan and the governmental authority that they're operating on this earth. But they're not, they're not, but in order to differentiate them from, the, from men, Paul talks about under the earth because now they're associated with the underworld. But listen, that doesn't mean their activity is confined to the underworld. It just means that's what they're operating in connection with. Everybody understand? In other words... They are operating in this world and they are doing things. What we're going to be talking about today is really important because it's going to be some groundwork and foundation for things that we're going to see in much more detail as we work through the book of Ephesians in chapter 4 and again in chapter 6 a little later on. But there is an authority structure for Satan's forces that are on this earth. That's the things that are under the earth. Okay, now with have, having said that, let me just say that, and, I, and, 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 and really I'm just kind of mentioning it because when I was first studying this, I got to thinking, what about once, once evil has been put down? Is there going to be an authority structure for things under the earth? Because we know what that is. In fact, let me just see if you're tracking along with me. Give me, a, so we said principalities and powers, that was an example of things in heaven. Uh, we, we talked about the governmental position of kings and 
governors, governors. Uh, what, that, that would be things in the earth. Give me an example of things under the earth. If, if I'm right about what those are, they're operating on the earth, but it's part of Satan's earth, part of the supernatural realm. Huh? Okay, 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 Somebody, okay, what else? I'm sorry? I, oh, mites, oh, 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 you're doing the, you're, you're using those names, okay. So, look, let me, uh, that's true, that's true. Look, I'm, th- and, and if you're looking at some of those others, how about the rulers of the darkness of this world? That would be something that would be here. What's a real common one that we would think of? And, and, and we would... How about unclean spirits? And when we read about those accounts... And so what I want to do is I want to give us an example of the things that are under the earth so that we kind of get an idea about what that's like. So let me turn us over to Matthew chapter 8 and take a look at this. So here we go. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. It says, but the men marvel... Oh, by the way, let me just give you a little bit of a background to this. We're just jumping into Matthew 8. Jesus has been over on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, and he's been teaching. When he gets through teaching, he gets in a boat, and he says to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. While they're on their way across the Sea of Galilee, and if you've never been there... I mean, we, we say the Sea of Galilee, when you look at it on a map, it looks very small. Actually, that's a, a pretty big body of water. And when they're out on the Sea of Galilee, a storm comes up, and it's so violent, it's threatening to sink the ship. The Bible doesn't talk about it this way, but Jesus is sleeping. They're about to perish. They go down and wake him up. And they say, don't you care that we're about to die here? The ship is going to go down in this. And Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves and everything calms down. And and when he does that, look, I have my own thoughts about that. I actually believe that that is a satanic attack in an attempt to kill Christ. I don't think Jesus is in the habit. I mean, if you look through the scripture... I don't think he's in the habit of saying, well, it's really windy today, I'm just going to calm the wind down. Or I'm out on the boat and the waves are really tossing. We don't have a lot of accounts of that. I think he intervenes in those circumstances because there's evil behind those circumstances. And he's countering that evil. Now that's my opinion of that, but the Bible doesn't make any comment about that. Again, that's one of those examples, just like remember... Uh, the, the, at, at the, what was the pool of Siloam and when, when, a, when an angel came down and troubled the water whoever was the first one that got in got healed and there was a guy there I actually think that's something that's going on in Satan's realm uh, and we've talked about that a little bit before I don't, that's not God doing that uh, that really doesn't fit the criteria for what God is doing and uh, anyway, anyway I think this is another one of those things so, so in this Now, knowing about that storm, that introduces you now to verse 27. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Now, Let me just, uh, well, I guess we'll keep reading here. And and behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. Okay, now I want to give you a map. And I may have printed it. Is, it. is there a map printed in your notes? Okay. So if you look at this, I'm going to blow it up on the PowerPoint. Over on the right-hand side of the Sea of Galilee, on the eastern side, there's a dotted line that actually comes up below the Sea of Galilee, and then it moves right up 
to, to, to the right hand side and on up. That dotted line is that major road that ran right beside the Sea of Galilee. Everybody knew about that road was well traveled. But when Jesus is on the other side and he says, let's go across to the other side, his disciples know what's over there. What's over there? There's two guys over there that are possessed of unclean spirits and they're terrorizing everybody up and down that road so that people don't want to travel that road. And that's exactly where they're going. So when they get over there, and I'm going to pick this up now in the book of Mark, but Mark is going to make a switch for us. He's going to quit talking. He's not, Matthew talked about the two. Mark is going to focus on one. And so let's take a look at this in Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Okay, so he's just going to concentrate on the one, Mark does. As it turns out, there's going to be a lot of devils inside this guy. But notice the way that the scripture says it here. There, there came out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He talks like the guy just has one. But what you're going to find out is he has lots. Why would the Bible say he just has one? And that's what we're going to discover. It's going to have to do with things under the earth. So this is, and this is what we're looking at here. It is because, I'll just give you the answer and then we'll read some verses here. He only talks about one because there is an authority structure and only one is in charge. So he's not, I mean, you are going to find out from the account there's a bunch of them, but, but really we're just concerned with the one. Okay, so now let's pick this up, Mark chapter 5 and verse 3. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, talking about this man, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, by the way, I'm not trying to raise more questions, but does it seem odd to you that it says when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him? I don't see anything about what he's saying here that's very worshipful. That word worship is really talking about acknowledging Jesus for who he is. It's not, oh, Jesus, we think you're so great, we love you. We're not, the typical things that you would associate with worship, that's not what's going on here. Okay. Now, apparently, uh, when he runs up to Jesus, the words that are being said to Jesus, even though it's the man talking, now think about this carefully, is this the words of the man or is this the words of the unclean spirit? It's the unclean spirit. That, that tells you something here, but let's, okay, so let's pick this up now in verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. See, he's still talking in the singular. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, the interesting thing to notice here is that Jesus isn't talking to the man. He's talking to the unclean spirit. That's the first thing. And, and, and when he asks him his name, he's not trying to carry on a conversation. He's not going, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What's your name? You know, he's not doing that. When he's saying, what is your name, what's he asking for? Yeah, he's asking, yeah, he wants to know his rank. He wants to know his position in Satan's realm. He wants to know who it is that, you know, what, what kind of power am I dealing with here? And so when the guy says, 
My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, if you remember a few weeks back, Madison asked me a question when the session was over, when we were first introducing the fact that a name isn't always an appellative, that sometimes it's talking about a position. She mentioned this, and she said, is that what's going on with the guy who said his name was Legion? And that's exactly what was going on there. Okay, so take a look now. Let's see, we were there. Now I'm going to take you over to the book of Luke, and, uh, and we're going to see this again uh, in the book of Luke. And it says in verse 30, Luke 8, 30, And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. So how big is a legion? Well, back during the time of Romulus, early in Rome's history, a legion was 3,000 foot soldiers and 300 horse soldiers. But that number really changed. As Rome grew and the empire grew, a Roman legion grew to 6,000 foot soldiers and 600 horse soldiers. Some historians say there were a time in the Roman Empire where a legion was 12,000 soldiers. There's a lot of numbers all over the board. Now look, among the Jewish people, the word legion was used not to describe a specific number, but just to indicate a lot. We do that too. If, if, you, if you ever uh, go to a restaurant where they really give you, you know, big portions of food, and let's say it's an Italian restaurant, and out comes your plate, and there's this big mound of, you know, spaghetti on there, you might look over and go, man, they gave me a ton of pasta. Do you really have 2,000 pounds of pasta? Not really. You just have a lot. And that's the way the Jews often use this word legion to say it's a lot. Now... Because, but because this is an authority structure and not just a casual conversation, I kind of get the idea that it's more than just a lot. <laughs> because what's a lot? I mean, if you're, using, if you're actually using a technical military term, I'm sorry, in my head, I keep thinking about when I worked at a Christian school one time, it was an ACE school, and there were kids in every grade, and they're working, and when they need help with something, they put up their flag, for those of you not familiar with ACE, and there's a little boy named Michael, and, uh, you know, he was just starting out with, you know, with stuff, and he put his flag up, and I went over, and I said, what's going on, Michael? And he said, I need help. I don't understand this. And I said, okay, so I knelt down right beside him, and I said, okay, instead of me just telling him, I said, let's read it together and then let's see what it is you don't understand. And so I put my finger up there and I started reading. And when I looked over at him, he's not looking at the book, he's looking at me. And I stopped and I went, are you ready? And he went, yes. And I said, okay, so here we go. And I started reading, I look at him again, he's looking right at me. And so I go, now you have to understand, this is years ago, and I go, Hey, Michael, are you looking at the two hairs on the top of my head? And he went, oh, Brother Mike, you got like 50. And I thought, oh. <laughs> to him, that was a number that described a lot. To me, I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm down to 50. <laughs> okay. So anyway, the num the, but, but here's legion. So legion is a specific military term. And because there's a hierarchy in those positions under the earth, in other words, they're operating in the world, but they're associated with the underworld. They're not men, in other words. So I tend to think that we probably got one of these numbers of a Roman legion that's being used here. Now, you could say, well, okay, so... What, what was a Roman legion at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry? Well, it varied between four and 6,000. Now, you said, well, then, then there was four to 6,000 of these unclean spirits in this man. I mean, perhaps, uh, I, I, I don't think it's important to actually identify the exact number, but, you know, when I was looking this up, 
You remember you have in your Bible a centurion. A centurion. And when I looked that up, this is really crazy. A centurion, what would you guess? He's over how many? You would say a hundred. When I looked that up, it said in Rome at that time, it, he was over 80. <laughs> and I thought, but we get that word century from 100. You know, what, what centurion? Anyway, it kind of threw me off. Anyway, all I'm saying is those names, legion, centurion, all of those are positions of rank. And I wanted to take a look at that so we kind of get an example of what we're talking about when we're talking about and things under the earth. So th those are the things that are there. By the way, I use this also because I wanted to introduce to you a little bit of a thought process. We're going to do a lot of that today about things that we're going to pick up later when we talk about spiritual warfare. So just kind of remember some of the things that I've talked to you uh, uh, about here because we're going to greatly enlarge in those later on. Okay, so... Last week we looked at that truth at the end of the lesson that Jesus actually has two names. One in connection with his position on earth and one in connection with his position in the heavenly places. We know from Revelation 6 that his name for his position on the earth is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then I took you over to this scripture, to 1 Timothy 6.15 and it says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay, so both names that Jesus has are in that. And, and I mentioned this at the first, but I want to expand on this a little bit. Look at the first phrase in this verse. Which in his times he shall show. Now why times plural? Because he is going to occupy those positions. What are they? King of kings and Lord of lords. Blessed and only potentate. He's going to occupy those positions at different times. Now, understand this. The Lord Jesus Christ is and always will be manifesting His presence in the same way He did following His resurrection. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that the Son of God is not omnipresent in the same sense that God the Father is. Because Jesus is manifest in a body. That body is only in one place at a time. Now when we talk about the... And we are going to talk about the omnipresence of the Father. But let me just give you this, okay. Now, why is, why is God able to be omnipresent? Because God is a spirit. The, 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 the body of Jesus is not a spirit. In fact, he's going to say that. We'll read that verse just a minute. Let me give you this one in John 4, 24. In that resurrection body, it says, God is a spirit, talking about the Father, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what does it mean when it says God is a spirit? It means that he is not confined to a material body. It means that God the Father can be up in the third heaven meeting with the divine council and at the same time he can be meeting with Moses on Mount Sinai. And he can manifest his presence in both of those places at the same time. Now when most people talk about God being omnipresent, you know what they're saying? God is everywhere. But the thing you need to understand is, although God has the ability to be everywhere at the same time, He is not manifesting His presence everywhere. In other words, not in a way that you understand, oh, I'm in the presence of God. Now, does God know everything that's going on? Yes. And you could say He knows that because he's there. So there is a sense in which God is able to be present everywhere and see everything that's going on. But God has another quality too. And that is omniscience. What is that? That means he knows everything that is true and possible. And how long has he known? Yes, he's never not known it. Now when you look at that, someone would say, well, how do you do that? 
Well, that's the difference between being God and not God. If you're not God, it's even hard to understand that concept fully. But if you are God, that is a part of who you are as God. Okay, so it means that God now, the Father, is able to manifest himself in different forms. Now, and because he possesses that foreknowledge, then it's true that nothing happens without his knowledge. Now, I want to illustrate this by taking us back to Romans 12. I'm going to do three things here. Number one, I'm going to illustrate this thing about God knowing it all and why that's important. Number two, I'm going to take us back to Romans 12 and I'm going to give you some details that we did not see when we studied that the first time. Number three, I'm going to give you a groundwork of information that will set us up for things that we're going to study in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in Ephesians 4, and Ephesians 6. So I'm going to do all of those at the same time. And so that makes what we're about to do very important. So here's the verses that we're looking at. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now when Paul writes that we're not supposed to avenge ourselves, and by the way, what is this talking about? It's talking about personal retribution. This is not talking about the law of uh, the, the system of justice that we have that is able to right wrongs. It's not talking about that. It's talking about you taking that into your own hands in your own personal life and carrying a vendetta forward. But we have trouble obeying this. Why do we have trouble obeying this? I can think of several reasons. And so I want to talk about them very shortly. First of all, we have trouble obeying this because... Now, for you guys, we talked about this for about 30 minutes after the service the other day, but nobody out there heard it. And so I just need to introduce it. But here it is. When you come into this world, you are dead in trespasses and sins. Yes? And because you're dead in trespasses and sin, you don't personally know God. There's another thing you don't know. You don't know His ways. So when you come into the world, you don't have anything in you that tells you how to operate and how to function. But that starts getting programmed into you by everything that goes on in your life. The kind of home life that you have, the school that you go to, the particular teachers that you have, the kids you play with in the neighborhood or on the playground, the kind of church you go to or didn't go to, all of those kinds of things start programming how you think about things. And let me tell you, almost none of that is godly. It is all just how people operate in the world. And that's what's in you. When you get saved, now there's a whole lot more to talk about that, but we'll save that. But if you understand the concept that you're growing up and you're getting ideas about how the world is and how you should respond to things just from all the different things that you're exposed to, along with any kind of traumatic events that may take place in your life and some other things as well, then all of a sudden you start having this idea, this is how I live my life. Then one day you hear the gospel and you get saved. But nobody clears out everything that you learned before. You take all of that with you into your Christian life. And now you start living your Christian life out of that. That's still not God's ways. And really, just because people got saved doesn't mean they really know God. They know things about God but it doesn't mean they really know God. And Satan is counting on that. Because if he can keep you in that condition, your life will be one constant stream of misery. And, and, and he knows that you will never become what it is that you are supposed to become, that what God designed for you to become. And we don't obey this scripture automatically 
Because that's not how we got taught. And that's not how the culture is. Almost every action movie imaginable is people taking personal retribution for the wrongs that are done to them. And you know what that does? That creates this kind of thinking in you that makes you say, okay, well, this person was really, really bad, and they did this thing, and so this person deserves to be able to go and do this back to them, and that will kind of even the score. That'll be justice. That's how you're supposed, that's how the world thinks, and that got designed, and everything that you see speaks of it that way. And so if anybody ever comes along to obey this, we think something's wrong with them. Because all we've got is this mindset that got put in us before. So the first reason we don't obey this is because we never got taught that. So then when you read it in Romans 12, people read that and it never, it never occurs to them there are some things that I was taught about this issue that are not true. And now I am living my life based on those untruths. And when you do, there are consequences in your life personally now that you're going to incur because you are living in a way that is based on the untruth. And so part of the renewing of your mind is to replace the lie with the truth and then match your conduct and behavior with the truth. And if we don't learn to do that... Now look, there's, there's two very, very, very important processes that go hand in hand with that. And before we get out of the book of Ephesians, we've got to learn them both. And you will. And you will. But you have to understand that when, we, when things happen to us and, and, and we don't obey the, the scripture about that, it's first of all because we don't really have a background for that. But there's another reason, and that is because this verse, Romans 12, 19, has not yet effectually worked in your inner man to change your thinking and transform you. We are not really aware of the fact that God sees everything that happens to us and in view of that, He has said, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. If that was working in us, we would obey it. But when it's not working in us, now we go do our it's just a version of the thing that we have always used. And so I'm going to give you, so I'm, I'm going to kind of walk through some things here. Our part in this is, first of all, to replace Satan's untruth with the truth of the Word of God. And then our part is not to be motivated by our anger, but to be motivated by godliness. There's an important thing here. And you know what? I, all, I, look, I, I've been in church all my life. I've you know, studied for sermons all my life. I've heard so much stuff from one end of the spectrum to the other. You would not believe it. Let me give you an example of how wild it gets. So when Jesus remember, said to this uh, gathering demonia, I remember when, when he said... You know, he, he, he told the unclean spirit to come out of him. And he said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. I've heard a preacher say, because here's the order. He says, he told him to come out. And then he said, what is your name? And I've heard, I've heard a preacher say, you know what? Jesus commanded him to come out, but he didn't come out. And Jesus was surprised. And so he went, wow, what's your name? And he's acting like Jesus was helpless to be able to do anything about it. He's like, wow, I, you know, you, 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 you're, you're way stronger than I thought you were. I just didn't realize. I, I was telling Mark about this one time. I said, can't wait till the judgment seat. And he tries to explain that one. 
that Jesus was going, oh yeah, I couldn't get that guy out because, okay. See, I just, it's just, it goes to the ridiculous. My point is to say, I hear those things that talk about what we're about to talk about here, about these verses and, and what they say. We don't, I guess my point was to say, everybody talks about this kind of stuff, but they don't explain why. Why is it when he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. In the next verse, he's going to say, Recompense to no man, evil for evil. How's he going to end the chapter? Overcome evil with good. We went through these verses, and we talked about them. But here's what nobody talks about is, because you want to say, if you say, why are we supposed to do that? Can we just do this for a second? You know, let me just, of course, I gave you the notes out early, so I mean, okay, so, but look, when you do this, someone looks at it and says, well, that doesn't seem right, because it looks like they're going to be able to do something to me, and they're just going to get away with it. See, you, don't, you, you are not keenly aware of the fact that God says, vengeance is mine. How much does he know? He knows it all. See, you think you know it all because it happened to you. God knows more than you know. And there is going to be a day of reckoning. When is the day of reckoning? The person who offended you is a believer. Remember the body of Christ. Where is that reckoning going to take place? Judgment seat of Christ. Let's suppose they're not saved. Where is that reckoning going to take place? Great white throne judgment. But is God going to let that slide? He cannot. Why? Because He is, by His very nature, a God of justice. He cannot be unjust for one moment. You understand that? And that's why He can't take our sins and sweep them under the rug and go, I forgive you. That wrath gets poured out on somebody. And that somebody is the Son of God. So justice gets poured out on Him so He can offer us mercy. But God's not just letting stuff go. When you understand, but there's a reason that He's telling you, don't take this into your own hands. And if I were to say to you, why... Some people would get a noble answer and they would say, well, because really we should be thinking about the ministry that we're supposed to be having with this person. Let me give you an extreme example. So here's a young lady who, you know, is, um, she's out somewhere shopping and someone grabs her up and she gets raped. And it's a very traumatic event in her life, and she survives it. But now, a lot of things have changed with her now because of that event. And she is fearful, and she is angry, and she is hurt over that. And you say, so Mike, you're going to say that the Bible is going to say that she ought to forgive that guy. And I'm going to say, yes, it does. It does, and she should. But nobody talks about why. Nobody really talks about why. You say, well, because you're hoping that one day maybe she could have ministry with him. Actually, she might probably never see him again. So it's not like, but I mean, you know, but if, if she did, you know, you would hope that one day the guy would get saved and all. But if you, and so a whole lot of, whole lot of bad things come out of this. Someone says, well, look, we don't forgive people if they don't ask for it. Stop. You're, that's totally wrong, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why. But let me get back to the reason why. Do you know why she will forgive him? Because if she doesn't, the bitterness that wells up in her will destroy her. Not, not having this personal avengement toward people who wrong you, 
is not to protect your offender. It's to protect you. Because when you... You know what bitterness is? Bitterness is you drinking poison hoping it'll kill the other guy. And that's not how that works. You say, well, gosh, if I let him off the hook, and that's the whole point, isn't it? You're still hooked to that. But let me show you, let me show you what Satan does. So an event, in this case, a very traumatic event. But it doesn't have to be a traumatic event. It can be all the years of your life that just taught you how to respond to things in a very particular way going on. But an event happens, and now... Because of that event and the hurt that happens to it, your, emo your emotions come into play, and indeed they do, and I'm not going to ever advocate for anybody not to have those emotions. We're going to read a verse in just a moment, Ephesians 4, where Paul is going to write, Be angry and sin not. So he's not denying the emotion. But look, so those emotions come into play, and then because we don't know God's ways, we develop a way now to try to insulate ourselves from the effects of this. So we try, to, we try to find some way to do that. And what happens is we hear something or we have seen something in the past or we start thinking something and that something becomes a false guide. Because it's not, a, it's not a true thing. It's actually an untrue thing. When so, when that, when, let, me get, I, let me just give you a wild example. And I don't, I'm not going to get bogged down in this. But let me give you this example. So here's a young lady and something like that happens and she's thinking, there must be something wrong with me that this was allowed to take place with me. Is that true? Is that what God is doing? Or she says, you know what, God must not love me because if he did, he would never have allowed this to happen. Is it true that God doesn't love her? See, what's happening is thoughts are coming into her head. That's what these false guides are. They're either thoughts that she has heard from someone else or that she has concluded on her own or thoughts that have been given to her by the adversary. Actually, let me be more specific. Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against, give me those next two, principalities and powers. The principalities and powers are in charge of putting thoughts in your head that are contrary to the truth of God so that you might now base your life decisions on that which is not true. And if you do, a whole host of things that the Bible calls tormentors are going to start happening to you. You're going to feel guilt. You're going to feel bitterness. You're going to feel resentment. You're going to be fearful. It's going to make you anxious. And all of those things are going to plague you. And there's no way that you're going to be able to undo that on your own. Until finally, you know what those will do? Those will drive a person to become unstable. They just won't be able to function normally. And they'll never be the son or daughter that God desired for them to be as long as those things are in control. And you know what's happening here? This is actually, you know, let's just talk about this. That's, that's what's happening in your soul. I can give you another example. So... Here's a kid, doesn't matter if it's a guy or a girl, but here's a kid, and um, one day, it, 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 I don't, it's, just a, it's just a situation. Maybe it's at school, maybe it's at gym class, maybe, you know what, they're out at the mall, it doesn't matter. But you know what, this thought, you know what, here's a, here, here, here's a, here's a, let's say here's a girl, and she, it's, this thought comes into her head that says, you know, I'm just kind of looking around here, and I, I think actually I should have been a boy. I shouldn't have been a girl. I should have been a boy. If she entertains that thought. Now, there is something, there's a process you're going to learn 
where the Bible talks about taking every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And there's a way to do that. You're going to learn that. you got to be kidding me. All right. So l- let me just do this because it's important I get through this thought. <laughs> I, know, I know, can of worms, right? So they have this thought. Look, here's a girl. She has this thought. Maybe she hears someone say it. Maybe she, you know what? Nowadays, she can see it on television. And that's wonderful for Satan because, yeah, you, know, you know what, get this message out there and we can do that. And she has this idea, and because she has this idea, she doesn't know how to discern what is really her thoughts and what are the thoughts that principalities and powers are orchestrating for her. And when they orchestrate a thought, it's always the next step which seems logical. I'm going, to, I'm going to divert from that just for a moment and give you an example. So, let you know. <laughs> so, let, 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 here, here's a mom, and you know what? She's got three kids or five kids, it doesn't matter. They're always yelling and running and causing chaos and place a mess. They're fighting with each other. They're, you know, being disrespectful. They're doing the stuff that she doesn't want them to do. She's at the end of her rope. You know what? She's just not having a good day. She doesn't feel well. She feels like she's not getting any help from her husband. And she just, just at the end of her rope. And then, you know what? And so here she is. She's got these, she's got these three kids. She's got two kids that are just that old. And she's got this new one. And she's just wore out every day. And a thought comes into her head that says, you could kill these kids. And you'd be free from this. And you could get away with it. Now, for you, that's a thought too far. But there are people in this country that that is not a thought too far. They have actually now been pushed to a place where they entertain that thought. And so you know what they do? They devise a way to get rid of their kids. And it happens in all kinds of ways. And it is because... A thought thought got put in there. They didn't know the difference between what they were thinking and what someone else was thinking, what what, what some principality or power planted in their head. And now they have believed a lot. So here's the thing. So So let me come back to this one. So here's a traumatic event. And that thing now creates, because they don't know God's ways. They don't really know Him. They just know stuff about Him. They're just trying to find a way to cope. And, but the way they're coping with it is all wrong. And so all of a sudden, they start to believe that which is not true. And because they're not believing the truth, they are open to more and more of this, building on that untruth. And now all of the tormentors are taking place. Our life is even more miserable and that, and that, and what I was getting at is, and then this, then all of that turns into a stronghold. So when the Bible talks about every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, when the Bible talks about pulling down strongholds, there's a process by which we do that. Listen to me carefully. Everybody listening to my voice today has a stronghold somewhere. It may not be killing you, it may not be ruining your life, but it's there. And at some point in our sonship life, we're going to run into that stronghold and you're going to have to know how to pull it down. Here's the other thing about strongholds. Most people don't realize that's what's going on. They have been deceived by it. And so they just don't know. So what we're doing here is we're talking about being aware that our enemy is able to put things into our heads. So when the Bible says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, if we think God's not really concerned or he's unaware, that won't work in us and we'll never obey that. 
if we don't understand why he's telling you not to avenge yourself, because you are opening the door to the adversary to be able to establish a beachhead in your soul and, and actually now get you living out of a lie that you come to a conclusion out of. Look, when, let, let, let's, look, I happen to know someone. When I was up in North Texas pastoring, there was a family there. There was a young lady that had been raped years before and, and years went by. Here's the thing. If, that could haunt someone for 20 years until they identify the lie that came out of that and replace it with the truth and find freedom in Christ. And that can be done. And it doesn't take a long time to do it. It actually comes with identifying the stronghold and for them being aware of it and seeing it. and replace. There is no lie that cannot be countered with the truth. There is no stronghold that cannot be pulled down. All of that is... And, and, and look, and we better know how to do that not just for ourselves but also for those that we have the opportunity to talk and minister to. And see, here's the thing. You don't need to be a specialist to be able to do this. This is spiritual work that's sitting in the Bible for every single member of the body of Christ. And so we're going to walk through that. So I'm using this, as you can see, as an example to prep us a little bit for the thing that we're really going to be talking about when we get over to Ephesians 6 and put on the whole armor of God and wrestle against principalities and powers. What I'm doing here also is giving us an example of what's going on with regard to the spiritual warfare that's taking place here on this earth and those things that are under the earth. So there's a lot to, to, to be done here, and I know our time is up, but look. If you can concentrate on every form of doctrine and get that doctrine working in you, that doctrine works to transform you and renew your mind. Because, okay, so let me just end with this. So when Paul writes this, that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. The only thing we think about reconciliation is about being saved. Well, being saved is, a, an, I mean, it's the foundational part of that. Of course, be reconciled to God. But you understand that you can be reconciled to God because you trusted Jesus as your Savior, and in your daily life, you're not reconciled to Him because you're living out of those strongholds every day. And they control your life. Here in Ephesians, we have to be able... We have to be able to identify those things and know how to pull those down and replace them with the truth. And then we can live out of that truth and it will literally, I'm not kidding you, it will literally change your life. And so it is very important that we get, and we can. And by the way, we, just to say it, we won't do it publicly in this meeting. What I will do is I will teach you how to do it and then you'll go home and do it. And, and you don't really need me to do it because I can't fix anything anyway. There's only one that really does that, and that's our Heavenly Father. But you need to know the process to engage in to be able to have that happen. So this thing is really protecting us. It's keeping us from having a... a, a false guide being established in our thinking and now we're living our life based on something. So you know what really is the problem? The problem is not the traumatic event that happened 20 years ago. The problem is the lie that we believed out of that event that continues to guide us every day. That's what you've got to identify and tear down. And, it, and it's a simple process and it can get done immediately. You don't need you know, three years of something. Anyway, I am, I am, I'm very enthusiastic about us learning about this because I think it's going to really turn the corner for us. We have moved for, from where we were to where we are, but now, <laughs> so let me, 
Let me, let me use Clifford's deal. Remember when we got over to Romans 13 and he went, are we ready to do this? Are we really ready to do this? This will enable you to be ready. I mean, really, you, you, are, you, you know now enough to know that this doctrine works in you. But to be able to know that, you know what, there's a way to uh, undo those things that are that have been established by the adversary. Okay, all right. Well, that didn't get us all the way through, but we'll pick this up next time. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And um, there's a lot of things here, Lord, and, and I know that um, it looks like they're complicated. Lord, once we really understand how this is working and what's going on, Lord, we will equip ourselves to be able to have battle with the adversary and with his realm and to be more than conquerors. All those things we read about back in your word in Romans 8, those things will be true for us. All things will work together for good. All of those things can actually be a reality for us. We have to be able to be victorious in this contention that we have with how Satan is working today in this world. So we thank you, Lord, for the ability to be able to do this for your word that is clearly going to give us direction about how to do it. And, um, and, and today, Lord, I pray that the things that we have said are, are going to prep our minds for those things which will follow as we continue on through the book of Ephesians. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity in Christ's name. Amen.